Uh, Mukesh, uh, let me welcome you. Thank you very much for taking your time out. Uh, this is an initiative just for uh, everyone's uh, awareness. This is an initiative by the overall startup community uh, with many of the founders and investors uh, coming together to see how we can uh, you know, share some of the knowledge and uh, best practices. Uh, one of the first things that uh, the community had done was earlier in the week to create a best practices uh, document, which is basically a collation of all the best practices uh, among founders, to put that together in one place, uh, which is available on uh, uh, the actgrants.in website. Uh, as part of that, the second thing that uh, we've been working on is uh, to create these webinars, and this is the first in the series. For the next two, three weeks, we'll try to get people uh, you know, who have uh, rich experience in these domains to make sure that the knowledge is disseminated. And uh, Mukesh has been actively contributing to this to share uh, perspective and experience from the past. So again, thank you again, uh, Mukesh. Uh, we also have uh, team members uh, from uh, the Action COVID team across the investors and founders as part of this uh, call as well. And uh, we'll, we'll cover more of that. Just, uh, just before we get started, just a few quick ground rules to make this uh, more productive. One is uh, the topic is largely around strategic relationships and m and during these times. And uh, Mukesh, with, with your experience actually on both sides, uh, through your experience through Mintra, uh, with Flipkart acquisition and uh, in CureFit, where you have actually acquired multiple companies. I think the experience on both sides uh, uh, brings in a lot of perspective. But just to keep this productive, what, uh, what we are uh, suggesting and requesting all the audience is uh, to ensure that the questions are relevant to the best practices in the current situation of COVID and how does one prepare as a startup uh, in the current situation. Broadly uh, around scenario planning, business restructuring, work from home, how do you make that uh, efficient? Uh, and how do you make sure that the health of employees is taken care, of, especially the field ops team who are still continuing to work a lot on the ground? Uh, and lastly, around communications as well. Uh, one other thing that we have done before we get started is we've actually collated a set of questions from the audience. Uh, uh, you know, one of the team members, uh, Aditya, from our side, we'll put up all the questions on the chat, uh, which are around 14, 15 questions. And through the course of this conversation, uh, we request audience to upvote them and we will pick uh, the top five, six questions uh, to have them answered uh, through Mukesh. Uh, with that, uh, can I request, uh, you know, uh, Aditya to start putting out the questions and uh, audience also feel free to have, if you have any further questions, feel, feel free to add those. Keep it crisp to make sure we can address those. Uh, we'll try to address uh, as many which are top voted. Okay, with that, uh, Mukesh, uh, shall we get started? Absolutely, thanks. Uh, it's a great initiative and uh, I'm delighted to be part of this forum. Really appreciate that and thank you very much. So maybe let me get started with uh, the first question. Uh, you know, m and and strategics are always a very touchy topic. And you've actually seen uh, many of these business cycles in the past, you know, more than two decades of your uh, work life and the entrepreneurial life. Uh, and you actually, you know, decided to join forces with Flipkart when Mintra was actually riding high, uh, was the leading player in apparel fashion. Uh, and from that context, in, in a situation where entrepreneurs may have businesses which are, you know, having extensively positive business, or maybe at a distress. What would be your advice to startup founders to view, how do you view strategic relationships and M&A discussion in, in these times? Right, I think first of all, you know, m and doesn't need, yeah, m and doesn't need to be a touchy topic at all. I think that's a part of, you know, normal growth and evolution of a company. I think no matter what stage of the company you are in, I think one needs to uh, have an open mind to discuss, you know, both type of m and Maybe as part of your growth, you are lacking a key capabilities that you can um, acquire through an acquisition. Sometime you can accelerate your roadmap through an acquisition, which is what you know we did in the early days of CureFit. We had a pretty extensive roadmap, but building some of those capabilities might have required six months to one year each. 
and we felt by acquiring an early stage company which already had that capability we can uh, start to put the platform together uh, pretty rapidly i think other you know consideration which plays a role in mnh is overall macroeconomic situation sometime you may feel you know you may have great product differentiation thing going well but the macroeconomic environment may not be in your favor and um, uh, you know let's say you know merging with someone or getting acquired by some larger company which is cash rich can give you that runway if i look at from mintra point of view you know post acquisition with flipkart mintra got you know five year of runway where it was fully funded by flipkart mintra didn't have to worry about competition and first time in mintra's life you know the team was able to focus long term think about building differentiation versus worrying about market share etc and figuring out what are the metrics to chase to be ready for next round of financing which can you know take the eye away from the core job of uh, building a strong business strong foundation so i feel you know as part of a ceo as part of you know strategy team board uh, one should uh, uh, you know look at mna uh, uh, just uh, from you know opportunistically and see you know it's it's all, I, i like to think of mna like a chess board right you know any given point you know chess board is set in a particular way and there is a best move to be played which you know makes your position stronger sometimes that best move may involve acquiring someone or getting acquired by someone and one should not uh, think of it any differently than any other major business decision very interesting and on on the same note see one of the things that is uh, always talked about is companies are usually you know bought and not sold uh firstly uh, do you agree with that and secondly how does a founder strike the right balance in terms of you know keeping razor sharp focus on the ground building the right product or solution versus uh, you know building some of these strategic relationships which may take you know many years to actually conclude into a formal relationship yeah i think there's definitely you know i think some uh, truth to that statement i think the way i'll interpret that is see at some level you know um, any uh, mna situation also it uh, the valuation you know it's it's boils down to supply and demand if you your company has a um, uniquely differentiated product uh, which has a lot of demand in the market uh, or you have a set of customers you know which are quite valuable or key capability you developed the chance here a you know, lot of other players in the space may want same capability and that will obviously drive up the price versus there is you know not much demand for what your company stand for it's very difficult to get a valuation that you know that you may be excited about so just being you know uh, having in in position of something which is uh, which has high demand in the marketplace of the let's say would be acquirers is what you know is going to determine the uh, the price you know there's really no point saying that you know what i have built in my own eyes is very valuable therefore i command high valuation valuation is you know just uh, the uh, laws of supply and demand applies to acquisition as much as applies to any product or service in the market so yes i think um, getting the point where the would be acquirers value the capability uh, i think uh, kartik what you mentioned that you know generally i think it's a good idea to stay in touch with the other folks in the ecosystem because just like you know uh, with vcs the potential acquirers you know uh, once they have some comfort with you you know the uh, uh, belief in the leadership team when they've seen you grow uh, over a period of time you know the confidence also builds up uh, so being in touch with the the people who can be potential acquirers without obviously disclosing too much you know which can be sensitive because you need to be careful going this conversation that uh, the person who may having may be having an exploratory conversation with you is likely having you know the same conversation with other players in the space is also most likely developing same capability in house so you need to be aware of you know what you are sharing what you are not sharing um, but uh, even with that risk i think being in touch um, is more helpful you know it's difficult for a company to make a acquisition decision mm-hmm. in a short order and any familiarity you have with the company you know will uh, hopefully make the process in a lot faster and efficient excellent so is it fair to summarize uh, mukesh by saying that look the r- clear focus has to be to build the right product and solution which has a differentiation but maybe from day 1 make sure that you are 
above there in the radar so that the conversations or visibility is there about what you're doing to ensure that the attention that can be attracted is uh, you know is there right from the beginning absolutely and i think it also helps in other way also you know when you reach out and talk to you know other companies in the similar or adjacent space who may be much ahead it's also a learning opportunity you know you get exposed to different ideas different approach to same problem which may inform you know how you think about your product and services so i think in general you know being out there and talking to people especially those who are closely related to the space you're working in i think has you know numerous benefits including you know opening up doors for potential amenity opportunities that got it on a different note now assume it it's a much smaller company and there is a possibility of an acqui hire discussion uh that's possible uh how does one go about initiating that in times like these where there is a very solid team which has been built up there is always this concern about uh you know potentially not getting the right bang for the buck so how, how do you time it in current situations uh, is it worth to be open enough transparent or is there a method to that madness yeah i think you know once you get to a point where a potential acqu hire uh, you know becomes a consideration that means somewhere you know uh, there has been challenges with the either the product market fit how you are building or there has been a challenge with you know fundraising now that may be function of you know how you have executed that may purely be a macro economic situation for example in the current situation you know you may be outstanding company but you start fundraising effort today and let's say you have you know two three months of runway left it is very very difficult uh, because most investors you know they are probably prioritizing for first you know setting us out some money for their portfolio companies their lps in turn may be wary of you know just want to wait the whole situation out and see how it pans out so it may you know may not totally be totally be under your control you know as a entrepreneur as a founder i think you have a responsibility to many share, many stakeholders you know obviously your investors but also your employees uh, especially in the early stage companies many of them take salary cuts you know uh, they come in with a you know promise of you know eventually things adding up but uh, may make a lot of compromise in the short term so once you're at a point you know when you're looking at a short term runway or product market fit uh, challenges i think acqu hire is not necessarily a bad outcome you at least you know are taking the company to a logical conclusion you know first and foremost you are ensuring that uh, your team finds uh, you know right uh, uh, place to continue i think acqu hire situation can also lead to an environment where the product or capability you build can get um, used in a different context the acquiring company may still you know, invest in that uh, or leverage some portion of the capability so at least the the work you know the you have produced over last you know few years uh, may end up getting used what's in alternate situation where you know you are thinking of you know you forced to uh, shut down the company you know the employee have to start uh, all over again from fresh um, the capability you have built goes to a waste so um i think in you know uh, many situations uh, getting acqu hired is a good logical conclusion for everyone uh, for uh, you also as a entrepreneur you know um, depending on the company being acqu hiring you know you may want to take on a job in that company and uh, you know reapply your skill set you might have learned as an entrepreneur in a larger company setup you know until you are maybe you know ready to start again uh, and sometimes i've seen many situations where people go on to Uh, play a very meaningful role, grow through the ranks, and become part of the management team in the company being a co-hire. So it's a it's as you know one of many you know, logical options that an entrepreneurial journey can unfold into. And one should, uh, uh, I think, you know, when the situation comes, one should um, look at it with open eyes. Perfect. And now let let me kind of switch the gear. On the contrary, uh, you know, a, a a startup which probably has enough runway. is able to survive and sustain in the current uh, environment but when you look at it overall it may seem like a good idea to probably join forces and not fight it out with a competition which can be a downward spiral for that entire segment mm-hmm. now how what would be your advice to entrepreneurs to look at from that perspective to have an open mind around thinking about joining forces 
or would that be probably a better idea to do that once the environment improves right yes yeah, so i think you know the uh, you know, um, uh, from you know most startups let's assume you know they are you know unlikely to be profitable and they are burning money every month so then runway becomes a very very important consideration and uh, i think the you know first and foremost thing to do in any crisis is to make sure that you are able to ride it out somehow right uh, this particular crisis is you know even worse because no one can really predict whether you know things will return to normal say 3 months from now 6 months from now takes a, or it takes year or longer so you really don't have a set framework uh, to decide how much runway you need but uh, safe to say that you know you need pretty long runway at this stage you must have at least 12 to 18 months of runway that gives you a fighting chance to potentially ride this out uh, use this downtime to keep strengthening your foundational capability so whenever situation turns around your product or service is a lot better compared to you know when the crisis started now if you don't have and there in a bunch of levers that uh, one can you know use to extend the runway but you still don't have the runway and you know there are a bunch of players in the same space i think joining hands can be a great um, a possibility because you can uh, use common infrastructure it may make it lot easier to uh, cut down you know the overlapping costs it may also make it easy for uh, the combined entity to go back to um, uh, the investors from both sides and ask for some bridge financing uh, because from investor point of view also risk goes down if there are two companies you know competing for the same market share instead of that now they have joined hands and there's a much uh, higher likelihood that as a combined entity whenever the things return they can command no much bigger market share without too much competition so i think it's a uh, you know if you have companies with similar capability in a space that you were competing before on um, joining hands with them at this stage uh, i think it's a quite a viable option that um, most companies especially the ones with shorter runway should think very seriously interesting uh, i i'll just take a <clears throat> jump into some of the audience questions which which has probably received a, a high number of votes some of the elements got addressed in what you shared yeah. in terms of strategizing for longer term uh, while focusing on business continuity what what you're saying is right now focus on survival uh, and focus on continue the longer term strategic relationships later on how would you uh, recommend uh, switching gears to a very different topic uh, you know workforce restructuring and you know the whole sensitive topic on how do you manage cash flows when obviously there is a lot of employees but at the same time there are costs as a business which also are to be managed and to have a 12 to month 18 month runway right so i think uh, cost side you know, broadly all the cost heads can be you know divided into four or five buckets so Uh, let's assume for most companies right now revenue would have trickled down to you know zero or much smaller percentage which automatically means that all marketing should be you know stopped immediately so you start saving that right away uh, if you have a large offline or retail footprint i think a um, lot of companies um, you know they have this force major clause in their agreement which is basically you know, in case of any you know um act of god uh the you know that uh, the terms and conditions of the agreement are not valid anymore so many companies i know are invoking that clause and going back to their uh, uh you know lease owners etc and saying you know we we need a rent moratorium or renegotiating rent uh same applies for utilities i think so that's other big cost head where one can look for you know 70 to 80% cost saving right away uh if you had any capex projects ongoing i think those are obviously they should be put on hold uh, immediately uh if you have you know uh, uh, uh loans and you have monthly principal and interest payments you can go back to banks and renegotiate the terms and ask for again extension and some kind of moratorium period i think most um, banks are open to that um and then you know that's uh, leaves the last you know cost head which is the employee salary i think um, this is something you know one needs to have more for wait and watch and eva- uh, and uh, uh, keep evaluating every month or two 
I think if I have to just give a you know broad framework, I think if you can afford it, probably not do anything for first month or two, so that let the uh, dust settles and uh, things become uh, more clearer. That you know what is likely scenario, and you know right, right now we're in India at least just you know three weeks into this crisis. So by April and May, uh, I think which way things are heading will be clearer. Um, and then I guess you know mm-hmm. if um, uh, probably you know first option should uh, still be that you know if you can keep most of your workforce intact uh, without affecting because in this situation I think finding alternate job also will be very very difficult for the employees being let go because mm-hmm. most people have put uh, uh, you know immediate hiring freeze. But let's say two months down the line you face a situation where crisis is getting worse, you don't have long runway, uh, you will have to uh, seriously think about payroll. Uh, between you know the option of uh, taking, let's say, company-wide salary cut versus um, laying off a workforce, uh, it's a much tougher decision. But I think most, um, if you look at you know, management uh, gurus and advice, um, they are of consensus in a short term. And by short term, I mean few months, the salary cut can work, but long term, you know, that's not a, a good option. I think in long term, you're almost always better off uh, reducing your workforce, mm-hmm. but uh, keeping the remaining folks, you know, closer to their market salary or some notional cut. I think it's very, very difficult for people to sustain with significant cut over longer period of time. So that's, uh, yeah, I think it's, this is a, a situation where, you know, each company to decide. Uh, it's very much a function of you know how much your monthly salary bill is, what is your total cash in balance, and also how your investor think about it. So you have to factor all of it. But uh, I'll still say if you can afford to, maybe take a month or so um, until the situation becomes clearer before you start acting on the salary part of your cost heads. Other cost head, I think, can you know um, you should have already acted on it. If not, I think you know next couple of weeks are the perfect time. To optimize, you know, maximum out of the all the other cost heads. Excellent, excellent. I know this is a <clears throat> this is a very uh, critical aspect and critical uh, topic uh, for many people, and it's it's important to uh, take a very measured approach, uh, keeping the humane side of things, while obviously uh, looking at the business uh, from a slightly medium term perspective. On the same uh, thoughts, uh, Mukesh, uh, now if with all of these uncertainties in the minds of people, uh, employees, and clearly working from home, at least extending for another, maybe a week or two weeks, yeah. How? what's your advice to entrepreneurs, how to keep their teams and networks motivated during these times? What are yeah. two, three tactical things and uh, you know elements that you would suggest? Yeah, so one is uh, communication, and I think uh, one should err on the side of over communication. So as a you know founder, CEO, the more you can communicate with the teams, the better. Uh, at CureFit, one of the things we do is actually we have a daily all hands on Zoom, and uh, it's uh, uh, not only you know what Ankit and communicate, but we have a lot of people from the team give you know share about their projects, their experience working from home, any interesting topic they want to talk about, and we see you know. 80 to 90 percent people dial in every day, so that has become a, a pretty strong engagement forum for us. Uh, for most of our active projects, we have a daily, daily stand up, so people show up there. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, the but equally important is also you know I think you know people may end up spending you know entire day in front of Zoom. I think you know which may inadvertently inadvertently lead to massive increase of screen time you know which we don't in the office. So it's also important to be cognizant of that and especially over weekends you know if uh, uh, you know this when you're working from home you know the boundary between you know weekday weekends starts to blur and things you know it becomes a one continuum which may not be very healthy in the long term so i think you know making sure there is a uh, you know active you know down period also where we are not doing any of the zoom calls daily meeting etc um, uh, are important um, but uh, but i think the key is is just you know maximizing communication um, both, you know, work-related aspect as well as non-work-related aspects. You know, at again, a few things you've done at CureFit is you've created our security helpline. So people who have any issues in terms of, let's say, grocery supplies or safety issues in moving around in case they need to move or any medical issues so they can reach out to the helpline and through that they have access to a lot of resources. 
uh, people who may be having uh, anxiety issues, so we've created a helpline for that. Um, we have created something called, you know, internally called Hobby Fit. So every evening we do a class, we invite somebody from within the company or outside. You know, it could be a cooking class or a sketching class and, you know, seeing huge traction on that. So just, you know, trying to engage people, you know, beyond uh, work related as well. That's interesting. So uh, I've, I've also heard of some uh, interesting uh, uh, pieces where some companies have adopted some virtual lunches once in a while, all get on to the same Zoom call, but just have lunch together. Right. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so switching back into the m and topic, and again, picking some of the questions from the audience. You know, the top question here is, how do you partner with much bigger firms and still be a valued partner in that relationship? How do you make sure it's not unequals, but to some extent there is value in that to create more value? I think the key to that is uh, for both sides to be clear, what is the unique thing you bring to table? Uh, so, you know, for the, um, as per a larger firm, you know, is there a part of the product that uh, your team is going to own or is there a business line or a category and I think, you know, making the, uh, in the initial negotiation, you know, making the boundaries very clear about that, that uh, post acquisition period, this is what we'll own. Also be clear about that, you know, we'll have six month, one year runway to build it because, you know, first few months are likely to be rocky, you know, uh, both firms are probably have different culture. Uh, so when you look at the same situation, uh, you may have a different point of view about, you know, what's the right way to um, go about doing it and, you know, to well-intentioned team may clash about, you know, what's the right way to do it. So I think you need to have uh, that um, runway very clear. Uh, you know, most, uh, most of the time the joint ownership don't work. So if let's say larger company has a similar category product, um, it may be a good idea to, uh, for another firm to agree to merge that back into what you are doing. So even though you are the company being acquired, but maybe that piece of the business end to end you own uh, so that they are not, not, two competing uh, products or category within a larger firm, which is, which is, you know, most likely lead to uh, fight for resources, uh, et cetera. Uh, and in general, you know, getting also thinking through uh, all kind of exit clauses also uh, very well and getting that all in your agreement, you know, what happens if, uh, you know, promoters are being laid off or if the employees are being laid off or, you know, the larger firm itself, you know, goes through an acquisition and so on. So I think just thinking through all those um, 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 points, which may um, become contentious in future, as well as just making sure the roles and ownership for first six to 12 months are very clear, uh, will give you the right platform to you know give it a good shot and try to make it work. Got it. <clears throat> and also for founders to think through this and actively you know do some of the reach out. Uh, do you do you suggest uh, entrepreneurs to go through say intermediaries reach out to potential bankers or uh, a better thing in a longer term is to build direct relationships apart from going through bankers yeah i think it's a combination of all i think you know you definitely need uh, at least you know one of the good banker or a good lawyer to go through the all the details of the transaction and make sure you know you are uh, negotiating uh, all the important points well, but uh, they can compensate for a direct relationship. And at the end of their trust, uh, the mutual trust is a very important factor. And as you go through negotiation, your know, direct principle to principle conversation, and during those difficult conversation, you also get to know each other's working style. You may pick up some red flags. And so while you're negotiating, you know, just being your radar open for how each of those conversations are going. Uh, do you feel that, you know, you are able to establish chemistry where you can have conversation about difficult issues yet find, you know, amicable solution. If you pick, uh, you know, really serious red flags, that may be one reason for you to maybe consider not going through with it because, you know, what you're picking is likely to repeat again and again in future and may lead to a very difficult situation. So I would say, you know, it's a combination of all three are very important as you navigate the uh, deal contours. And if, if one is on the other side, we're looking at uh, you are the one acquiring the business. Uh, what would be your advice to the entrepreneurs on thinking through between inorganic growth versus building the business, especially in current times uh, where 
historical knowledge also says that 50% of the acquisitions fail. Uh, but in current times, there could be many synergies which are possible. How would you suggest uh, entrepreneurs to navigate through this? Yeah, just uh, two, three questions I should answer. One is, uh, one needs to be very, very clear that why exactly are you doing this acquisition? Right? Uh, what capability does it add? Um, you know, are you just doing because, you know, let's say the, it's uh, uh, in the valuation is too good to be true or you really see a unique capability that you're acquiring, which was strategically important for you, but would have taken longer time to work. Um, sometime you may want to, you are, you may want to acquire to take out the competition, but in that case, it's very important to, you know, be clear about that to the company being acquired. I think in general transparency, you know, whatever your motives are and, uh, you know, uh, how are you plan to do the integration, the more upfront you can be about this to the acquiring company. So they are also taking uh, the decision with full information and they're not going to be surprised post acquisition, which can, you know, again, lead to a difficult situation for both sides. Uh, other important aspect is get full internal buy-in. You know, sometime, you know, especially if you have a competing team product, you know, category, and some folks internally think, you know, uh, they may have a different point of view. They may think, you know, we can build the same thing much faster, get there, you know, they don't think it's, um, whatever you are paying is worth it. So um, getting full buy-in from that team that they will work towards success of uh, this acquisition and, you know, collab and creating the right framework to, for collaboration, including, as I said earlier, merging, you know, both efforts are very important. Uh, so that, you know, to your point about many acquisitions don't working out, I think it's because a lot of these, you know, fundamental questions are left unaddressed and a lot of surprises open up, you know, come up uh, post acquisition, which lead to a disappointment on uh, both sides. So the more you can address it upfront, you know, it will give a, uh, at least good runway for folks on both sides and the right, you know, also incentives to try to make it work. Got it. <clears throat> uh, I'll just pick one audience question, which is slightly different from uh, m and but uh, how do you see new startup opportunities in the post-COVID world? Yeah, uh, tough one to answer because no one really has a crystal ball for what the post-COVID world looks like. I think one thing we can say for sure, it's, it, it'll look very different than what it is now. The longer the crisis continues and, and there is, you know, uh, all signs are pointing that this crisis is going to last for a while. There is really no short-term solution. So I think things will change in uh, quite a profound ways. If I were to take a few guesses, I think one is, you know, this uh, whole, you know, remote working will, you know, after a few months, people get used to it. It will become integral part of uh, our life. In the past, you know, all of us might have been very hesitant about, you know, doing things remotely and want to go into work uh, every day, you know, may not be the case anymore. In general, adoption of digital services will, I think, go up significantly. Because even when the crisis recedes, people will be somewhat wary of, you know, going into public places, crowded places. Um, at some point, you know, vaccination uh, uh, will come. And, you know, as people are getting vaccinated, they may be required to carry a digital certificate that, you know, I'm vaccinated, so I'm not a threat to people around me. Uh, you know, so I think, you know, for any place of congregation where a lot of people come, you know, how do you... Uh, prepare yourself for that setup, you know, where you might almost be mandated to uh, check uh, that. Um, I think overall, you know, marketing and advertising costs are probably going to go down significantly because spend people, you know, spending on ads will grow only slowly, but a uh, lot of people are spending time online. So digital inventories are, uh, are going up already. So when you come back to, you know, uh, start spending money again. I think your playbook for marketing may need to be quite different than what it was. Your cost of acquisition can be dramatically lower than what it was in the past, just because the amount of money being spent online, you know, for ads, which will be a lot lower compared to what it is in the past. Um, you know, uh, each industry, you know, will probably get impacted differently. So you need to think it through, uh, but be prepared for that. Like whenever situation returns to normal, don't try to use your own playbook, you know, chance, you know, they're probably better off starting from, you know, mentally starting from scratch about a new playbook and see what, what is the likely reality of your industry when things start to return to normal and prepare for that. Interesting. 
uh, again, picking one more audience question, which is actually very, very relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, from a startup founder's perspective, these are completely uncharted territories uh, and nobody knows what's going to happen the next week, forget the next month. Uh, with a clear view that, you know, one needs to have a 12 to 18 month runway. And if you had to get to the brass tags of advising entrepreneurs, how do you go about this? You know, how do you do uh, a week by week uh, kind of thought process in terms of strategizing what would be the ways in which you back yourself and manage stakeholders to navigate these uncharted territories? Yeah. I think a two, two part answer. I think when it comes to runway, etc., you can't have a week to week discussion. I think um, uh, people should think it through. I mean, see, you, I mean, you will know how much money in the bank you have. You will also have, you know, you can get a sense from your investors if, you know, they have the appetite and resources to extend any bridge financing, etc., or not. And that, you know, you end up with, let's say, X dollars. Uh, you know, what is your current burn? Um, let's say A. Uh, you can also compute what is a burn B that you need to, you know, have 12 to 18 months of runway. And then whatever that delta is between A and B, it will require you to make choices, you know, across all your major cost heads. You should think through, deliberate on those choices, but then, you know, decisively act on that. So, that, you know, after you have implemented those, you at least you know, have 12 plus month runway. And having secured that, then I think execution um, could be uh, more, you know, day to day, week to week. I think I saw one question around, you know, the whole notion of wartime CEO. I think crisis is a time where you know you can't really afford to think very long term. You need to be very tactical. You know, um, opportunities may uh, come up you know um, quickly. So I think just uh, uh, this is a, you know probably a good time you know for short term thinking. Uh, you know, um, having secured a runway, you see an opportunity, you pounce on it. You see a wastage, you know, you move swiftly to clean that up. Keep a lot of actions going. Crisis is also always a good time to just, you know, um, uh, almost, you know, get rid of your you know, past sins. You might have made big mistakes. You might have started, you know, four product lines while, you know, one is really core. Uh, so you can be decisive about, you know, shutting down two or three product lines because those are not core to you. Uh, so it's a good, you know, cleanup time where anything which is uh, not needed, something you may have been ambivalent about in the past. So it's a, uh, uh, you know, you have that license right now to reset things, you know, reset to whatever you think, you know, you know best judgment is almost like, you know, if you ask your question, if you were starting the company from scratch now, what are the things you will do and what I think you will not do and whatever, you know, falls in the category you will not do. And but what you are doing is because there's a, uh, you know, you know, momentum around those, you know, those are started in the past or maybe acquired in the past. So today may be a good opportunity for us to for you to just you know clean those things up and uh, focus all your energies to you know what what really matters. Excellent. Uh, I'll I'll probably just take two more questions in the interest of time. One other uh, audience question around scenario planning. I think you've already answered that yeah. briefly. You know, essentially plan for twelve to eighteen month runway. Make sure you're thinking short term. Cut costs where it's critical. That's the key part. Nobody can predict what can happen six months down the line. So plan for short term. That's really the core. If, if I, if I summarize what you shared, yes. uh, how do you uh, advise on communication? So there are various stakeholders. We talked about employee communication, but there are many external stakeholders, investors, strategic partners. What is your advice on engaging these communication while nobody knows what's going to happen next week? Yeah, I think on the communication, um, um, I think one is transparency. I think the more transparent you can be about, you know, the challenges you are facing, how you're thinking about it. Uh, for some of the difficult decisions, you know, involve people. I think people are, you are likely to get more buy-in for decision when people also have opportunity to contribute uh, to the decision making, you know, put across their point of view. Communicate the same message to most stakeholders as much as possible. For every single thing, it may be possible, but generally, you know, 80% uh, plus situation, it is possible. So if you are, you know, uh, uh, you are transparent, um, you are inclusive in decision making, and you communicate same thing to most of the stakeholders again and again, I think that's really 
uh, will make sure that you know you are benefiting from all the ideas from the table. Uh, you get more buy-in from people, and no one feels at least short-sighted that you know I didn't see this coming or you know I had a different point of view. Um, there will be obviously you know hard choices, hard messages, but uh, the you know um, broad transparency with all stakeholders is I think is the best way to handle this. Perfect. No, very well said. Uh, transparency is the key. Uh, maybe one last uh, uh, parting remark uh, from your side. You know, what would be your single biggest advice to all startup founders and entrepreneurs in the current times? Uh, what would you advise all all the entrepreneurs? Right. Yeah, I think what I'll say is, you know, uh, uh, you know, as much as you know, crisis unwanted, it's a very much part and parcel of life. I think, you know, I saw one question about the 2008 financial crisis. You know, many of you may not remember, 2013 was also a particularly bad year for India. You know, at that time, you know, rupee depreciated significantly. A lot of FDI, you know, start flowing out of India. You know, the funding became almost non-existent. So every, you know, four or five years, you know, on a small scale or large scale, you do see a crisis. Uh, I think one of the patterns people have seen in the past, you know, a lot of outstanding companies come out of crisis period because, you know, it's a whole thing about, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So now it's a time for you to exercise uh, that, uh, you know, uh, uh, advise and see, you know, if, uh, if, you know, what can you do to first of all, not die during this period, uh, somehow write this out. You know, and use that time to become very, very, you know, good and differentiated in what uh, is really cold to you. When things are going well, sometimes we don't have time to focus on foundational element, you know, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, we keep accumulating a lot of tech debt, you know, a lot of automation is not built, a lot of auto, you know, analytical tools are not built. So you can, you know, take care of all those housekeeping stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, you can improve usability of your product significantly. You can rethink the unit economics of the product and service you sell so that by the time, you know, things start to return back to normal, your product would have, you know, become much, much better. And, you know, maybe a lot of your competitions, do, you know, they don't survive this period. So, you know, you are, you know, maybe one of the only few player with highly differentiated product. And, you know, and then you will obviously attract a lot of funding, a lot of customers, etc. So there's a way for, you know, one to play out the crisis period to one's advantage, but all of that really matters if you, if you can also figure out a way to last it out. Excellent. So survive the current crisis and uh, crisis always leads to good differentiated companies emerge. Yep. So that's, that's on, on, on that great positive note. Uh, thanks again, Mukesh. Uh, it's, it's been wonderful interacting with you as always. And I'm sure, uh, you know, many of these words of wisdom are definitely valuable for many of us. And we intend to continue this endeavor and have more communication with uh, the overall startup community. Thank you, Karthik. Thank you, everyone on the call. Uh, I really enjoyed this discussion and wish, you, uh, wish everyone all the best. Stay safe. All right. Thank you very much.